My grandfather had a scar that ran all the way down his leg from hip to ankle. He used to come over from the old country to fish in Alaska. When I was a kid, he was too old to do much hard work, but he liked to come anyway, just for fun. An old timer who wanted to be with his family. He had been fishing herring and cod since he was a boy. My grandfather had the accident on a supply ship on the North Sea. While they were putting a hatch cover down, he got his leg caught in the opening, and this giant steel lid, the hatch, fell on it and split his leg from top to bottom. When we visited Norway that year, he was on crutches, walking back and forth in the living room trying to recover. The stitches were still in. It was a gruesome wound, like something you'd see on Frankenstein. He really got mangled. My brothers and I kept staring. Of course, it scared us, but it wasn't so traumatic that we decided crab fishing was too dangerous. We knew it was part of the job. He just got unlucky. His name was Sigurd Hansen, and that's who I was named after. My other grandfather's name was Jakob, and when I was born, each grandfather thought I should be his namesake. My parents debated. In Norway, even if you didn't choose a relative's exact name, it was considered an honor to pick one that began with the same letter. So my parents settled on Sigurd Johnny Hansen, with the middle name pronounced Jani. Even though it's an honor to be named after my grandfathers, I can tell you that when you grow up in America in the 1970s with a name like Sigurd Jani, you're going to get a lot of black eyes. I was born in 1966 in Ballard, the Scandinavian part of Seattle, by the ship canal. All my parents' friends were Norwegians and fishermen. There were a few Swedes and Danes, but other than that, we didn't really socialize with anyone else. My parents didn't have to speak English much. They didn't go to PTA meetings or things like that. My mother's English wasn't great. My father was gone nine months out of the year fishing, so my mother was home with us kids and didn't get out to the broader public much. All she needed to know in English was how to get by at the grocery store, how much things cost, and how to pay for them. In first grade, they sent me back home with a note that read, Teach him English. Stop speaking Norwegian. Right about the time I was born, my parents moved out of Ballard to the northern part of Seattle to a bigger house with a yard. A lot of the Norwegians of my parents' age were moving north, too. This small community was a great place to grow up. When my brothers and I walked to junior high school, we'd stop by our cousin's house and walk the final blocks together. We went to the Rock of Ages Lutheran Church in Ballard. In elementary school and Sunday school, there were a lot of Norwegian kids, and we spoke the language to each other. Sometimes we'd ride our bikes all the way down to Fisherman's Terminal in Ballard to check out the boats. Our fathers were all fishermen. A lot of us would go back to Norway for the summer or Christmas break and run into each other back there. Just like normal American kids, my brothers and I were on soccer and baseball teams, played in the school marching band, and sometimes even babysat to earn spending money. We also knew we were different. We knew we were Norwegian, and we knew we were fishermen. Mom says she always knew I would become a fisherman. In school, while the other kids learned ABC and 123, I would draw a boat and a crab pot and a black swirl coming out of the smokestack. I got my first chance to see my father at work in Alaska in 1978, when I was 12. I rode the Northwestern with him from Seattle across the Gulf of Alaska to the Aleutian Island chain. It was a 1,700-mile trip that took more than a week, and most of the time I was terribly seasick. From there, we motored another 400 miles north through the Bering Sea, three days without sight of land. We finally dropped anchor off St. Matthew Island, a deserted outcropping in the far northern Bering Sea, right by Russia. Bizarre formations of volcanic rock rose up from the shoreline. Since it was summer near the Arctic Circle, the sun only dipped below the horizon for an hour or so, and the skies never darkened. I was wide-eyed with wonder. Suddenly, my world of the Seattle suburbs had expanded into something vast and strange and full of adventure. My dad's life as an Alaskan fisherman, to me an abstract concept that he'd talked about for years, was suddenly vivid and real. 
We fished blue crab that year, but I was just a kid and not much use. What seared a stronger impression on me than the actual fishing was the thrill of exploring this exotic new world. At one point, the fishermen went on strike, and we were laid up in harbor with 150 other boats. To pass the time, a few of the other kids and I took a skiff and ventured onto the island. We found deer darting across meadows of wildflowers and rams roaming the rocky hillsides. We discovered a stream so thick with Dolly Varden trout, we were able to scoop them up with our bare hands. We wanted to fish the lake that the stream poured into, so we returned to the ship and crafted a reel by wrapping dental floss around an old strawberry can. We bent nails into hooks and sharpened them in the grinder and splayed bits of polyfiber line into lures. We returned to our lake and tossed out our lines with a bit of lead for weight and pulled in those Dolly Vardens one after the other. It was the height of summer and the weather was warm. Another thrill of that summer was to finally see in action all those beautiful crab boats that I'd been drawing pictures of for years. My friends and I took the skiff from boat to boat and climbed aboard to meet the crews and have a look. A lot of the guys were friends of my father. If they weren't, they were still friendly and welcomed us aboard to check out the wheelhouse and the deck gear. We poured over every inch, as if we were in a museum. I remember a crabber called the Neptune, That big wheelhouse, all painted black and white, looked like a race car. What a beautiful boat. By the time I was 15, I knew every boat in the fleet. I'd see them on the horizon, and I could pick them out just like that. The older guys on the crew would just look at me, shake their heads, and say, how the hell can you see that far? Probably the most important part of that summer was getting to work alongside my father and the other men who would become my lifelong mentors. They were larger than life. Dad's friend, Odvard Medhaug, worked on deck that summer. He was a classic Norwegian, hardworking and stubborn, from the same mold and same town as my dad. In later years, he would become one of the most successful skippers in the Alaskan fleet, what they called a highliner, but that summer, he was still a deckhand. I idolized him. When he came down from the deck to wash dishes in the galley, I snapped pictures of him as if he were a celebrity. After two months, I had to get back home to Seattle for junior high school. They dropped me off on St. Paul Island, another rock in the Bering Sea. I had to overnight by myself. The bar was next door to the hotel. The natives and fishermen were drinking, and it started to get pretty wild and very loud. I could hear bottles crashing and fights breaking out. Only 12 years old, I was terrified and hid beneath the window in my room. In the morning, I flew to Cold Bay, which is a tiny outpost at the tip of the Alaskan Peninsula where the Aleutians start. There was nothing but an airstrip and a store and a few weather-beaten buildings, then Anchorage, then Seattle. It took a couple of days. The summer of 1978 was a huge adventure filled with hardship and fear and wonder and excitement that left me wanting more. I had discovered my ambition. I wanted to be a fisherman and a man like my father. From that point forward, my life became a quest to prove myself a real fisherman in his eyes. The next summer, I went to Norway and fished with a third uncle named Hans. We fished for cash, and he'd pay me some spending money under the table. Once I turned 14 in 1980 and was confirmed in the church, I felt like I was an adult and was ready to get out of Seattle and find adventurous work. So I left school early that summer and went gillnetting for red salmon up in Bristol Bay with John Jacobson. He was a friend of my dad's from Carmoy, a hell of a great fisherman and a mentor. John didn't hire many greenhorns, but he made an exception for me as a favor to my dad and because I already knew my way around a boat. Before I left, my father took me down to the supply shop and bought me boots, rain gear, and a duffel bag. He even tried to buy me one of those flappy orange southwestern hats like the old fishermen wear, but there I drew the line. As much as I wanted to emulate him, I was just too young to dress like an old-timer. The old man even helped me pack my sea bag. He paced around the house and double-checked my gear. 
I could tell he was nervous about me going up to Alaska without him, but he never said a word about it. He wasn't the type of guy who easily expressed his emotions. Instead, he gave me the type of fatherly advice one gets from a stoic old Norwegian fisherman. Keep your mouth shut, do what he tells you, and everything will be fine. Then he put me on a plane, and I flew north.